It is no secret what God can do. <clears throat> Christ was not crucified secretly. He was crucified in public. And because of that, it means salvation. Our salvation is not a secret affair. It is something that is available to every person sitting right here and every person out there. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful song. And thank you uh, to the children for that uh, powerful message uh, about Christ's crucifixion. This morning, we are looking at a message entitled, Don't go to church next Sabbath. Don't go to church next Sabbath. If God was to come to you and told you that next Sabbath, please don't come to church. What would you make of that? There are things in life that we know that affect our faith that sometimes become stumbling blocks to us. Sickness is one of those things. Loss of a loved one shakes our faith. Having no job, financial challenges, they shake our faith. But are there good things that can shake our faith? Are there things that are right, things that are not wrong, that can affect, that can become stumbling blocks? Are there things that Christ himself told us to do That become stumbling blocks. Don't go to church next Sabbath. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, you want to speak to us this morning. We invite you now to speak to each one of us individually. We pray that your presence will be our experience this morning because we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want us to move to the end. Fast forward. Let's go to the end of time. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 and 30, up to 36. Matthew 25, Verse 34 to 36. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me.
Jesus talks about the final judgment. And if you read, you continue reading that passage. He has two groups, one on the right, one on the left. And at the end of it all, he says to those on the right, take your inheritance, your inheritance, which is the kingdom that God has prepared for you since creation. And he lists some of the things that perhaps we can say are some of the things that made them to be on the right and not on the left. Let's look at another text. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Now here Jesus is talking about false prophets. And Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Two groups. In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about a group and lists the things that they have done. And he says, enter in the kingdom that God has prepared for you. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus describes another group who have described what they have done. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Interesting enough, when you look at Matthew 7, Jesus himself told his disciples that he was going to send the Holy Spirit who was going to guide them into all truth, who was going to make them even do greater things than what he had done himself. And these Pharisees in Matthew 7 have done greater things. They have cast out demons. They have healed the sick. They have performed many miracles, but Jesus says to them, away, I never knew you. The question is, why the difference? Is it the works that they did that made the group in Matthew 20, 30, uh, 25 to inherit the kingdom? Is it the works that the people in Matthew 7 make them be condemned? That's the question that we want to try and answer this morning. Our main passage, we'll look at a very short story that is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Remember, we are looking at the title, Don't Go to Church uh, Next Sabbath. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She said she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet 
listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus responds, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one thing. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now this was the first visit by Christ to Bethany. Christ came several times, if we read uh, throughout the, the gospel, uh, several times he came to Bethany uh, with his disciples. But this story was the very first time that Jesus uh, uh, visited Bethany, and they had come with the disciples uh, from Jericho, a very long distance uh, on foot. And then they came to Martha's, uh, Martha, um, Mary, and Lazarus' home, uh, where they lived. Mother welcomed them. If we read uh, verse 38, they were welcomed by Martha, who was the owner, believed to be the owner of the house, and was the elder sibling of the three. As they went in, I imagine Jesus being led by Martha to the living room and made comfortable. And immediately, Martha disappears from the living room, leaves uh, Jesus and the disciples uh, with Mary and gets busy in the kitchen. Now, again, when you look at this story, that is what is expected. If you have visitors in our tradition, if you have visitors, they come home. Immediately you greet them. Usually the wife will quickly disappear. Uh, into uh, the kitchen uh, to just make sure uh, the family is hospitable enough uh, by providing a snack or something to drink for the guests. And this is exactly what uh, Martha does. He leaves them in the living room and he goes to the kitchen and gets so busy uh, to prepare for the, um, the visitors. Verse 40 and 41. Now, that's where the story becomes interesting to me. The Bible says, But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. If you read other versions, the Bible says, Martha was cumbered, Martha was troubled by the preparations. Uh, that she had to make. The question is, why was Martha troubled? And why is the Bible describing a good thing, being hospitable to the visitors as a distraction to Martha? Verse 41, Martha comes to Jesus and asks, don't you care that I'm here by myself doing everything to prepare the food for you. Meanwhile, my sister uh, is just having a field day in the living room with you. Now, when we read the spirit of prophecy, it says, as Jesus and the disciples were entering Martha's room, Jesus continued his conversation with the disciples, teaching them about how to make it to heaven, the conditions that are necessary for them to inherit uh, the kingdom of heaven. And Mary is described as sitting with them. In verse 41, Martha is described as being distracted by doing something good. Again, the question is, 
Is it possible that something good can distract our faith? Is it possible that something that is not sin, something that is not right, something that is not wrong, can actually be a stumbling block to us? When we look at the story very carefully, Martha, the destruction that Martha had was that he missed out on the opportunity to be with Jesus. If we read 41 and 42 again, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried, you are distracted and upset about many things. But a few things are needed, or indeed only one. I like that part. It's like Jesus is correcting himself. He says, a few things are important. And then he says, actually, not a few things, only one. Only one thing is needed. And Jesus goes on to say, Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away. And again, the question is, what did Mary choose? What is being described as better? What is being described by Jesus as a better thing? I like two phrases in that passage in verse 42. The first phrase is that Mary has chosen a better thing. A better thing. That's phrase number one. And the other phrase is that only one thing. So the first phrase, a better thing, indicates that what Martha chose was not bad. It's only that what Mary chose was better than what Martha chose. But Jesus is saying, what Martha chose is distracting her. It is good, but it is distracting her. But what Mary chose is the better thing, which is not distracting her. Again, the question this morning, what good things are distracting us as University SDA Church? What good things that we are doing are distracting me as an individual? What good things that are acceptable by everyone, that are acceptable by the church, that are acceptable by God himself, what good things are distracting me from eternal life? Is it possible that the good deeds that we do could actually be distracting us from eternal life? Is it possible that doing what Jesus has told us to do actually distracts us. Jesus says, Martha, you are distracted. You are worried about so many things. Mary has chosen the better part, the one thing. So Jesus is not condemning Martha. But he is actually making a commendation that what she is doing is good.
But there is something better that she could do. And she refers to what Martha, what Mary chose, which is the only thing, the better thing that was important for her salvation. And that is a relationship with Christ above service for Christ. Sometimes, as believers, we might be so service-oriented, doing everything that Christ has commanded us to do, doing everything that the church requires us to do, doing everything that society expects a Christian to do. But Christ comes to us and says, you are distracted. Sometimes we might be too busy in the service of God. We might be too busy working for Jesus and we forget about Jesus. We might be too interested in the Great Commission. Go ye therefore. But we forget the person who has sent us. Jesus points to Martha that a life at his feet, a life of humility and contrition, acknowledging our sinfulness and the power of forgiveness that Christ offers is a better thing. Jesus tells Martha and tells us today that a life that is sincerely given to Christ A life that is transformed by Christ is a better thing than a life that is busy for service but without Christ. Jesus is reminding us this morning that a better thing is a life in the presence of the one who gives life. A better thing, the one thing, is a life that is rested in him. It's a life that prioritizes a relationship with Christ. Now remember Christ did not say what Martha was doing was wrong. And I'm not saying service for Christ is wrong. But Jesus says there is one thing that is better than service. And that is a life in Christ. That is a sincere and deep relationship with Christ. There are things that we can achieve in various ways. Students, let me start with the students. Now, one of the things that I tell students <clears throat> the first time I meet them, especially postgraduate students, because most of them, these are students who are already working, have a good job. Um, so most of them, what they want is a paper added to them because maybe their job requires that uh, if you have to become a director of what, you have to have a master's degree or you need to, uh, to have uh, such qualification. So one of the things that I tell students is that there are two ways of getting a master's degree or indeed a, 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 a doctorate. Uh, one way, the easy way, is to do the barest minimum that you need for you to pass the exams. Just make sure you pass all the courses and uh, just, just, just find a way of passing. 
just clear all the courses and uh, you'll be good. you get your, at the end of the day, you wear your gown and you graduate. But there is the better way of getting your degree and it's to learn. So someone who uses other means uh, to, 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 to try and pass the exams, there's a possibility that he might fail. In our time, I think the, the worst thing that was there, the worst practice was, I don't know whether it still exists, those in NS, uh, medicine, uh, agri, vet, engineering, do you still have crooks today? It's still there. Soft copy now, it has just transitioned from hard copy to soft copy. Now, those who don't know what crooks is, so crooks is where you are doing a lab, uh, a laboratory uh, assignment. Uh, so you go to the lab, you spend three hours on the afternoon, and then you are required to write a report. Now, for whatever reason, those laboratory exercises were not very clear. You are doing the lab, but you really don't know what you are doing. But at the end of the day, you need to produce a lab report. And so, Crook's Law just made you look for a previous lab report, just copy, just change a few things here and there, your name, uh, your computer number, just leave all the other details. So if you did Crook's Law, the lab technician, whoever is marking your lab, will mark it and you get your marks, 8 out of 10, or 10 out of 10, whatever it is. But you haven't learned anything. You've gotten your mark, but you haven't learned anything. Nowadays, it's even worse. Students hire people to write assignments for them. So they actually, people actually advertise on the university for assignments. You can contact me at this number. And so someone will write the assignment for you, and then someone will get the A plus on an assignment that he didn't even uh, do. At the end of the day, you will have done what is expected. You've cleared your CA, and uh, you clear the pass at the end of the day. You clear the course at the end of the day, you graduate. But the better way is to sit and learn. Learn the actual stuff. Appreciate what the chemistry is. Appreciate what the biology, the physics is. And then you will never go wrong once you have learned. Regardless of how hard the exam will be, if you have learned, you will pass. If we go back to Matthew 25, 34, and 36, the two groups, and Matthew 7, 21, 23, in Matthew uh, 25, 34 to 36, where Christ tells those that have been faithful on the right hand to inherit uh, the kingdom that God had prepared for them. And in Matthew 7, where he rejects those which he says, I never knew you. One interesting thing, if you compare the two groups, look at who is talking. Who's making the pronouncements? In Matthew 25, verse 34, when Christ talks to the faithful, it is him commending them. He tells them, you, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to see me. When I was homeless, you gave me shelter. And they say, when did we do these things? They can't even remember. And Christ says, when you did to the list of men, you did to me. So it's Christ pronouncing the deeds. But when you look at the other group in Matthew 7, 21, 23, it is the Pharisees who are saying, but we prophesied for you. But we cast out demons for you. But we healed the sick.
The first group, they didn't care about what they did because they were doing it because of who they were. It was just coming out of them naturally. They didn't put effort in visiting the sick. They didn't put effort in visiting those who were in prison. Now, uh, uh, this, this, this is not my testimony. I'm just, uh, I'm just giving something that happened to someone. If you borrow money from someone, uh, someone who is kind, or if some, someone who is kind, let me put it this way, if someone who is kind does something, a deed of kindness, someone who is kind, he's kind, that's him, that's her, that person is kind. If they do something, come back to them a few months, years later, they might not remember what they did. They might not even remember that they helped you in one way or the other. But someone who is not kind, if that person helps you, they will rub it in your face. If you borrowed money from him, they will even remember the clothes you were wearing. They will even tell you, you were even wearing a green dress when I gave you the money. It shows that their kindness, they put in a lot of effort. It was even painful for them to help you. Two groups, both kind. One group does, does not even remember what they did. The other one remembers uh, to greater detail. The message this morning is saying, don't go to church next Sabbath. The question is why? Let me just decode the title. The bottom line, brothers and sisters, the heart of the matter of the message is that there are good things that we do There are good things that Christ has commanded us to do that will actually make us miss, miss the kingdom of God. And we will miss the kingdom of God not because of the things that we did, but because we did them without something that is bigger than those things. We did the acts of kindness without Christ in us. We focus so much on outreach without having Christ in our lives. We focus so much on visiting the sick because it was a requirement, not because Christ, the great physician, is in us. And therefore, this morning, Christ is saying to us through the words that we find in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Come unto me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now these words, when you look at the context, of course there are many things that we can apply this text. But at that point, one of the things was the burden of religion was the burden of the requirements that the Pharisees had stipulated as requirements 
for believers. It was the burden of doing the good works. It was the burden of following what Jesus commanded them to do, but without Christ in them. And so this morning, Christ is inviting each one of us to choose the better thing. Yes, let's continue with the good things that have been prescribed for us to do. But let's not neglect the better thing, which is the one important thing. Let me end by a story, a very common story that has been told several times about an auction sale. So a story is told of a man, a very rich man, who had a son, and they had traveled the whole world collecting different pieces of art. And so they had all the very expensive, those who, are, who, who like art, just think of the most expensive um, artists, they had the art in their collection. So father and son were all into art, and they did uh, the collections. They had a very huge collection at home. One day, war broke out, and the son had to go to war. Later on, it was learned that actually the son died during that war in saving another soldier. A few months after that, the death of the son, a young man, a soldier, came to the old man's house, knocked at the door. And this young soldier had a big box that he was carrying. And he said to the old man, I know you don't know me, sir. Allow me to introduce myself. And he said, I am the soldier who your son was saving when he died. And then he gave the big box to the old man and said, this is a painting that I made for your son, of your son. So I'm not an artist, but I just wanted to do something. I don't know how I could appreciate your son. I don't have money, but I just wanted to do something. And this rough sketch of your son is all I could do. And he handed over the box. And the old man got the box from the young man, hung it in the living room, and he treasured it. He looked at it every day. Imperfect as it was, he treasured uh, the box. As fate might have it, a few months later, the old man dies. And so the old man is dead. The son is dead. There's no one to inherit the art, the pieces of art. And so an auction sale is called. And all these rich people from all over the world come. And the person in charge of the auction sale picked that picture of the sun and lifted anyone going $200, $100, $50, and it was silent. Again, he lifted a picture. Anyone bidding for this picture, it 
was still silent. Then people in the congregation start murmuring. And one spoke out, Sir, we came for the real thing. We didn't come for that picture. Can we please get to the real pieces of art? Not that picture that you are showing us. Again, the man lifted the same picture. Anyone for this picture? And no one. After a long silence, a man stood up from the back, looking very shabby, dirty clothes. Clearly, he was coming from the field, from the farm. And this was the gardener for the old man and the son who had died. And he said, I only have $10. Can I get it for $10? And the man running the auction sale, he says, $10, going, going, once, twice. And no one else bid for the, for the picture. And people again started murmuring, can you give him? Then we get on to the actual thing. And so the auctioneer gave that picture to that gardener. And then the crowd cheered in excitement that now we are getting to the real thing. But then the auctioneer said, uh, let me just read something that I couldn't read until this point. And he got a piece of paper and read, read what was written. And the paper said, He who gets my son gets everything. So he who gets the picture of my son gets everything else in this auction. And that's, that was the end of the auction. My brothers, my sisters, Christ this morning is reminding us that there's only one thing that matters above everything else. And that is Christ in our lives. May we make it our prayer to accept Christ to have a deeper relationship with him because it's only him who can bring all the other riches here on earth, in the earth to come. It's only by accepting Christ as the only and sole Lord of our lives that we will inherit the kingdom of God. May God bless us as we contemplate on making Christ the one thing in our lives. Shall we stand as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the free gift of salvation. We thank you for reminding us that the only one thing that matters is a life totally surrendered to you. That the only one thing is a life that is housing your presence inward. Heavenly Father, your presence in our lives will enable us to do these other good things because that is your nature. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because it is no secret that salvation is free to every man who accepts. Help us this day if we haven't accepted you to accept you into our lives. Help us to renew our commitment to you. Help us, Heavenly Father. 
on a daily basis to be reminded of the one thing and only the one thing and which is you in our lives. Yes, we may do these other things. We may keep the Sabbath holy by not doing any other work. We may preach the word. We may visit the sick. But without the one thing which is you in our lives, it's all in vain. Help us now to accept you. Help us to renew our commitment because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh.